Good evening and welcome to our virtual town hall on the city and UCSF's response to COVID-19. My name is Francesca Vega and I am the Vice Chancellor of Community and Government Relations here at UCSF. The purpose of this evening's town hall is to provide members of the community, including our many community partners, with an overview of the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on San Francisco. This evening, we will reflect on this unprecedented global public health crisis. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the devastating toll of the coronavirus pandemic. Our hearts go out to those who are sick and have lost loved ones and livelihoods. UCSF will continue to work and partner with our community, our elected officials and policymakers, as well as our business partners to address their needs. Amidst the challenges we are all facing, there are bright spots. We are heartened by the incredible outpouring of support and encouragement of our community during this time. And we salute our heroes, the unbelievable care providers on the front lines across the healthcare system, as well as unsung heroes working behind the scenes to support them. We appreciate the critical partnerships with local, state, and national agencies our elected officials, community-based organizations, academic and industry, and coordinating response efforts. It is my pleasure to introduce the agenda and speaker for this evening's discussion. discussion. We will begin with an overview of COVID-19 and its impact on San Francisco with UCSF Chancellor, Dr. Sam Hawgood and Dr. Grant Colfax Director of the San Francisco Department of Public Health. We will then follow with a discussion on COVID-19's impact on patient care with Mark Larratt, President and CEO of UCSF Health, and Dr. Susan Ehrlich, CEO of the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. We will then have at least 20 minutes for questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A function on Zoom to submit questions. And please note that this meeting is being recorded and will be posted on our COVID-19 website. Thank you. I will turn it over to Chancellor Hoggood. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this town hall on COVID-19 for our neighbors, uh, friends, and alumni of UCSF. I would like to start by giving you just a very brief uh, overview of the uh, COVID-2 virus, uh, what it is, what it does, why we are so worried about it, and how, how it is that it has spread so remarkably into a global pandemic. And then I will invite my uh, partner, uh, Grant Colfax, uh, Director of the Department of Public Health here in San Francisco, to talk a little bit more about the San Francisco uh, response. So I know it's a very diverse audience this afternoon, and I apologize uh, if there are any uh, real or budding virologists in the audience, but I'll just give you a very brief overview of the coronavirus itself. We've known in the scientific community about coronaviruses since about 1960. They obviously were circulating in the animal and human populations probably for centuries before that, but they got their name coronavirus in the 1960s. And we, for the first 50 odd years, we knew them as a cause of the common cold the sniffles, the sneezes, the, the watery eyes, they cause about 40% of the common cold every year. Not a particularly dangerous, although sometimes annoying uh, infection. But in the early 2000s, in 2002, there was a significant mutation in the common coronavirus uh, that became what was known as SARS, a severe acute respiratory syndrome. And unlike the common cold, the mutated virus uh, was able to attack the deep dist distal lung uh, and cause a severe bilateral pneumonia and uh, sometimes fatal respiratory distress. In fact, of the roughly 8,000 people that were afflicted with the SARS virus in 2002-2003, around 10% uh, succumbed. To put that into some context, the seasonal influenza virus that uh, is in our community each year, the case fatality rate is about 0.1%. So SARS was 100 times more serious in terms of lethality than seasonal influenza. Fortunately, 
that a particular virus only survived about one year globally. It caused a lot of havoc, affecting about 8,000 people, but has disappeared from the global scene. In 2012, a new mutation in a coronavirus emerged on the Arabian Peninsula and has affected mainly the Middle East population, and that is called MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Affected a smaller number of people because it doesn't seem to be quite as infectious, but very serious with about a 30% mortality. Uh, and then just in December of 2019, so just four short months uh, ago, and as Francesca said, our world and really the global world has been turned on its head over the last four months when a third mutated coronavirus emerged in a province in China. Probably there was a single human uh, uh, infected, what, that was the very first uh, human infection. But in the face of, in the, in just four months, uh, that infection has now spread around the world. Initially in China, but they got their initial epidemic under reasonable control between the first uh, documented case in December and roughly uh, March of this year. So over a three month period, a horrendous uh, outbreak in China, uh, but then uh, control of the epidemic. Through probably travel uh, from initially China to Europe and then uh, Southeast Asia to the West Coast of the US and from Europe to the East Coast of the US, the virus has now spread around the world. Initially a major outbreak in Europe, Italy, Spain, France, Germany, England, and other European countries, and more recently uh, throughout North America. Uh, every state in the country and almost all major cities have now been affected. We know that this virus is probably more infectious, meaning easier tra to transmit human to human than either SARS or MERS, but it's probably a little less lethal than either of those two earlier uh, serious coronaviruses. What we do know is that it is spread by what we call droplet or contact. That means it, it uh, spreads through droplets that are expressed from the mouth or nose. Those droplets uh, drop to the ground through gravity. They can probably spread about six to nine feet through the air. Uh, and then when they land on a surface, uh, they remain infectious for a period of hours to perhaps as long as a day depending on the environmental conditions, such as the temperature and the surface on which they land. You can't contact the virus through the skin itself, but if it's on your hands or on your arms, and then you touch a mucosal membrane, meaning the eyes, the nose, or the mouth, uh, you can get an infection. Unlike influenza, where the peak infectious period, meaning your ability to transmit it to someone else, uh, occurs at the time of your maximum symptoms, uh, it appears with coronavirus you can be infectious to other people when you yourself feel reasonably well. The first symptom for most people, but not all, is a fever, followed by a cough. Fortunately, for 80% of people affected by coronavirus, uh, that persists for about two weeks, and then there is full recovery without requiring medications, other than the usual kind of anti-fever medications that you might take for the flu, or without requiring hospitalization or intervention by the medical community. But for about 20%, and that is uh, predominantly as you get older, uh, those symptoms progress to a bilateral lung infection that does require hospitalization. And in a smaller number, about 5%, that becomes extremely serious and it requires ICU care and all that goes along with ICU care. Eventually, uh, your body responds with its own immune response and uses uh, the immune response to clear the virus. And we're just beginning to understand how long the immunity uh, lasts when you have naturally cleared the virus. Those studies are just underway. In San Francisco, we noticed the very first uh, number of cases uh, in early March, but I would have to give huge credit to Mayor London Breed and her advisors, including Grant Colfax, who you'll hear from in just a minute, about the rapid 
and a decisive response that was put in place here in San Francisco and in the other Bay Area communities and eventually uh, the state of California. A state of emergency was declared even before the first case was identified in San Francisco and a shelter in place order was uh, declared before the first death. That is unquestionably what we call flatten the curve uh, and reduce the strain on the hospitals and allowed us to provide world-class care to those patients who do need hospitalization, but we have not been overwhelmed. And I'll let uh, Dr. Colfax talk a little bit more about the decision-making that went into that. And uh, I'm sure there'll be questions about that during the question period. So now it's my great pleasure to uh, turn the uh, town hall over to Dr. Grant Colfax. He is a long-term friend of UCSF uh, was in San Francisco in the early 80s when the city led the worldwide response to the AIDS pandemic. Uh, so a very experienced public health and infectious disease specialist and uh, a very close partner to UCSF through this entire pandemic. Grant. Well, thank you, Chancellor, and uh, good evening, everybody. It's a real pleasure to join this town hall and to help uh, describe the situation in San Francisco and to answer questions about this uh, global pandemic. Um, right now in San Francisco, I'll, I'll just go through some numbers and then talk a little bit about our, our collective approach. And I just wanna start out by saying uh, that UCSF, our, our partnership with UCSF at the health department has always been strong. It's only been strengthened as we take this collective approach. Uh, the science, the research, the incredible clinical care um, and leadership shown by UCSF has really uh, provided us at the health department with a stronger foundation to respond and best uh, protect our community and treat the people who unfortunately are sickened by, by this virus. So right now um, in San Francisco, our latest case reports, and I want to encourage people to follow the situation in San Francisco, you can go to our uh, city website, um, our coronavirus dashboard to see the latest data. Um, those data are updated on a, on a daily basis. If you just go search for coronavirus uh, city of San Francisco dashboard, it will give you the address. Um, but right now we have 1,019 people who have been diagnosed uh, with coronavirus, 1,019. Um, we've unfortunately had 17 people who have died from the disease. All of those deaths have been people who have had comorbidities, other conditions uh, that have, as we have seen across this pandemic, people with other health conditions, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, kidney disease, um, malignancies, cancers, um, they unfortunately do worse with this disease. And of the 17 people who have died in San Francisco, all of them have had uh, these comorbidities. Uh, in the San Francisco uh, healthcare system writ large, so across our hospitals, including uh, UCSF hospitals, our Zuckerberg Hospital, which is um, our, our public hospital, as well as other institutions in the city, we currently have 88 patients with diagnosed COVID-19 in the hospital, and uh, 25 of those are in the intensive care unit. So right now, um, because of the aggressive action that we took um, with the leadership of our mayor, Mayor Breed, um, the shelter in place order, the declaration of emergency, even before um, a case was diagnosed in San Francisco, and further aggressive action and strong partnerships with groups like UCSF, uh, we have flattened that curve of increases in um, the requirement of our health care system to respond. Um, our hospitalizations, and that's really the number that we're following very closely along um, with our death numbers, those numbers have held relatively uh, steady over the past 10 days. And that has given us uh, more time to more effectively um, reinforce our, our response. Going forward, um, our focus has been on, uh, will continue to be slowing the spread of the virus, the so-called flattening of the curve. Um, we saw in some countries um, and some jurisdictions, unfortunately, in the United States where this, this wasn't able to be done, um, it, the, the pandemic really overwhelmed 
the local healthcare systems. At this point, we are not seeing that. That could certainly change and could change rapidly. So we're continually to continuing to focus on sheltering in place, uh, maintaining physical distancing or social distancing, ensuring that people, um, when, whenever possible, um, wear face coverings, um, whether that be masks or, 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 or um, other facial uh, uh, coverings like, like bandanas, and ensuring that uh, we provide testing for the people at highest risk um, for being diagnosed, people with symptoms, people with high risk exposures, um, and other people who have come into close uh, contact with people who are at risk for, for COVID-19. So uh, that's really our focus on, on so-called flattening the curve. Um, we're also focusing on everything we can to protect the most vulnerable populations. And those are um, people over the age of 60, people with comorbid conditions, I already talked about that group. And that has been our focus, uh, both um, with regard to congregate settings, including nursing homes and skilled nurse, nursing facilities, in the homeless population, in incarcerated populations, and in our um, SRO hotels, making sure that um, people in those highest risk vulnerable populations have as much as possible the education, uh, the materials, the resources, the information they need um, and their families need to help keep uh, these people as safe as possible. Our other priority um, during this response has been ensuring that our healthcare workers and first responders have the materials and education and protective equipment that they need um, to stay safe. Uh, we're working very hard and UCSF has been an incredible partner in this. And some of you may have been reading in the news about the shortages in, in, in personal protective equipment or PPE um, that have really hampered um, uh, our, our response in some cases to, to fully respond to this. Um, but with the partnership of UCSF and others in the city, um, we have been able to maintain our, our PPE supply. Um, it's been in short supply sometimes, but on a daily basis, we have found a way. And I just really wanna thank UCSF for your uh, generous donations of masks and gowns and face shields, things that, uh, that we desperately have needed in order to ensure that our public health response is as robust as possible. And then another focus of our work has been expanding testing capacity, again, very much in partnership um, with the researchers and, um, and, and, and the labs at UCSF, as well as our own public health lab, expanding that capacity um, and also having to prioritize where um, there are situations right now where we simply do not have enough materials to expand testing as rapidly as we'd like. So we're having to make um, decisions about who gets prioritized for testing. And I talked about those groups uh, just now. And then we continue to focus um, with hospitals across the city to ensure that our response is prepared for a surge. So that curve that we talked about, flattening that curve in terms of the number of hospital cases, the number of people in the hospital and the ICU, that's held relatively steady over the past two weeks, which is incredibly welcome news. Um, but we are still focusing on ensuring that our hospitals have enough capacity. Right now, across our systems, um, we have about 1,200 um, uh, medical surgical beds and just over 430 ICU beds. Uh, that are available um, should this surge um, occur. I will also add that um, we are, along with our testing, we are launching in partnership with UCSF and Dimaji, um, an, an app company, an aggressive method to do contact tracing. Contract tra contact tracing is a key part of public health response and infectious disease. So this is not only um, uh, the, not only focusing on the testing part, so when someone tests positive, but having a, an intervention that is able to reach out to people who may have come into contact with that person to find out if they are at risk for, that, for, for, for the virus and whether they need to get tested and to provide them with the educational materials um, to help them uh, understand what exposure may have occurred and then giving them the information to call the public health department um, if they have additional questions or have symptoms or otherwise um, have need assistance um, for themselves or their family. 
So the last thing I will say, um, one of the things we're concerned about at the health department and we continue to focus on is the, the issue of health equity in this epidemic. Um, we have issues of health equity in times of, of before the pandemic occurred. Um, and we're very focused on working with community stakeholders, community leaders to better, um, uh, to prepare as much as possible with prevention and care efforts um, particularly in communities of color where uh, health inequities are, are further worsened by socioeconomic uh, disparities and this pandemic um, is is likely to continue to affect those communities even more so so we're very focused on outreach and engagement education and action um, with community stakeholders uh, in those communities so i will stop there um, and we will go on to the next speaker thank you Thank you, Grant. Um, now, uh, Mark Larratt, the president and CEO of UCSF Health and, and my partner at UCSF will talk uh, a little more uh, about hospital preparedness and what, what, what our healthcare workers are experiencing. Well, thank you, Chancellor Hoggood, and uh, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, town hall tonight. I just also want to add uh, the thanks of the thousands of UCSF uh, faculty and staff and students to uh, Grant Colfax and to the mayor for their vision and leadership in uh, being first to the plate to uh, put a shelter in place on March 16th, the day before St. Patrick's Day. And as a result, uh, we are seeing uh, uh, much less severe problems than other places around the country. Uh, I would just say that uh, on the, the hospitals, uh, when we first became aware of the, the potential for this issue and the possible surge, uh, put an enormous amount of effort into uh, creating extra capacity. All the hospitals in San Francisco have. Uh, at UCSF, uh, some of you may have noticed we've added uh, some uh, tents in the emergency parking lot, emergency room parking lot to screen patients. Uh, we took an entire floor uh, of uh, the hospital uh, on uh, Moffitt and, uh, or, excuse me, 15 Long, and converted it to a COVID suspect or COVID patient uh, unit. Uh, we're reopening our Mount Zion Hospital on May 1st with about uh, 50 beds uh, that we could serve uh, COVID patients. And we supported uh, the city and county of San Francisco, working with Dignity Health and in, in opening a unit at St. Francis. Uh, hopefully we won't need all that capacity. Uh, today, our, our census of COVID patients was 17 at UCSF. Uh, a couple days ago, we were at 23. That was our high water mark. So hopefully we're on our way down. Uh, but uh, as uh, Dr. Colfax said and Chancellor Hoggood said, continued vigilance is going to be uh, the call of the day. Just a few uh, comments about um, uh, some of the challenges, and then a little about UCSF's uh, role. Uh, uh, as uh, Grant Colfax mentioned, the PPE, uh, which wasn't commonly discussed before this, but everybody knows what PPE is now, uh, was a tremendous uh, problem. And we were very frustrated that uh, there was no organized way to, to get it. But in stepped uh, friends, uh, including uh, Mark and Lynn Benioff, Salesforce, uh, a team uh, who put people on the ground in China to help us source PPE. And with their help, we've been able to purchase uh, uh, hopefully adequate stores of PPE that we are sharing uh, with the city and county of San Francisco, other public hospitals in the area, other UC medical centers and so forth. So we're, we're hopeful that we've uh, made progress there. In the Q&A, uh, you might wanna, I saw there were some questions about testing. Uh, Chancellor Hoggood can talk about that in, in, in detail. But one of the great frustrations about testing is the single biggest challenge we've had is to have enough swabs to even collect the samples in the first place. Kind of crazy, we've developed spectacularly sophisticated uh, testing equipment, but there's a national shortage of swabs. So in the to-do list to remember after this is over is, We've got some things to do to make sure we're better prepared as a country uh, for the next COVID, whenever year that comes. I think uh, I'm particularly proud 
and I, I think all of you uh, can be proud that in San Francisco, once again, we've shown the way. Uh, when there were questions about uh, pregnancy and COVID patients, it's our team of, of national leaders, research leaders, who stepped up to do the very first research on that. Uh, the, uh, in the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, which has been just a, a tremendous uh, initiative, uh, uh, offered to help us with the cost providing free testing for public health departments in the surrounding or in the nine Bay Area counties. And we're just so pleased that we've been able to do that as a service to our region, something very special uh, about UCSF. Uh, some of you may have seen that uh, because our patient activity has been relatively low, we were able to send 20 physicians and nurses to New York uh, last Saturday to spend a month on the front lines. And today, uh, 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 Chancellor Hoggood and I saw some of the feedback from the people on the front lines, and it's a harrowing experience. Uh, we not only want to help there, but we also want to learn uh, so that in the event that we have uh, a serious surge in the Bay Area that we're completely prepared uh, and that we've learned the lessons uh, that, that others have as well. And finally, I'll just say that uh, uh, the members of Congress and the administration uh, have spent a lot of time uh, talking with uh, Chancellor Hoggood and me and others, uh, uh, Dr. Ehrlich, who will be speaking in a moment, about what our needs are, what our experiences are here, and uh, we've been able to, in our way, help shape uh, public policy. Obviously, we're, we're so proud to have uh, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi uh, representing us, and she's been a tremendous ally, as have our two uh, U.S. Senators. Uh, so we're uh, feeling uh, good at the moment about our patient volume. We're, uh, like most hospitals, all very nervous about what this means for all of the other patients, the non-COVID patients, how they're going to get their care, how we're going to get them cared for. Uh, because before this whole COVID-19 thing started, our hospital was operating at absolute capacity. Uh, so we need to be able to take care of those cancer patients, those GI patients, those orthopedic patients, and that will be on our to-do list in the coming weeks and months. But first things first, we need to get through this, this crisis. And uh, I'll just end by saying that as a public university, we are honored to be uh, part, partners and, and partnered with uh, completely with the city and county of San Francisco in helping fulfill the mission of, of serving everyone in this community. That means all members of the community, including uh, those who are, are in the, the most difficult economic circumstances. So we wanna be here to help uh, everyone and uh, you can always count on UCSF. So Chancellor Hallgood, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Mark. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Susan Ehrlich, who is the CEO of the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. For those of you who may not know, UCSF has been a partner for over a century with San Francisco General Hospital, uh, widely known as the best county hospital in the United States. Uh, all of the physicians at that hospital are UCSF faculty members, and we are so proud and delighted to be a strong partner uh, for Zuckerberg San Francisco General. And we were thrilled when uh, Susan was appointed as the CEO just a couple of years ago now or maybe longer, uh, uh, as she's a long-term friend of UCSF and the partnership has never been stronger. Susan. Thank you very much, Chancellor Hoggood. I am uh, so fortunate to be here uh, with, with all of you this afternoon uh, and to share a little bit about what's going on here at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. I, I wanna start my remarks uh, by expressing some gratitudes. And uh, some of these are gratitudes that uh, others have shared, but I would like to, to underscore them. First, I feel so fortunate to be in a city and a region where the leaders and the public health professionals have come together 
to work and ensure the health and safety of all residents through the shelter in place and other orders that have so far flattened the curve of the COVID uh, pandemic here in San Francisco and also help save us uh, literally in the healthcare system. I feel incredibly fortunate to be working with a team of people at DSFG, uh, including our UCSF partners, uh, but so many people here, including the people who uh, feed us, the people who take care of our buildings, uh, our nurses, so many people who have stepped up in truly extraordinary ways to serve the community here and especially the most vulnerable who we serve here in the community. And then uh, lastly, I'm fortunate, we are fortunate here to be supported by the entire community uh, to do the important work of caring that we do here. Uh, there have been tremendous philanthropists who have stepped up uh, to support us and support many of the things that we're doing during this pandemic. So let me say that the planning uh, for uh, meeting the challenges of the pandemic started weeks ago here at ZSFG, both internally uh, and as uh, Mark was saying, with other hospitals in the city. And the way I would characterize that planning is that it's been robust, it's been data-driven, and it's been truly collaborative uh, in many ways. And because of that, and because of our, our team here and our team in the city, uh, we are ready and we are serving the community well. Just to say a bit about the way a surge plan works and the way our clinical operations work here, um, it's best described by uh, what we call the four C's. Um, and those four C's are first uh, cohorting patients in all areas of the hospital, um, urgent and emergent care in the ICU and in medical surgical areas, uh, cohorting the patients who are uh, COVID positive and who are awaiting test results in very specific areas. They are uh, cared for by dedicated care teams um, so that we can ensure that the, the fewest people possible are exposed, that we are conserving PPE as well as possible, and that people become expert in that, in that care. We've also really changed our capacity to, uh, to be able to care for this population. Um, we're in a very interesting time where overall the uh, capacity in the hospital uh, is really changed. Um, we're seeing far fewer patients overall and yet there are certain parts of the hospital, in particular the ICU, which have been greatly impacted and serving more people than they typically do because of the pandemic. And then we work very hard on containment of spread, and that includes restricting uh, visitors um, and staff only to the most essential uh, and making sure that there are the fewest number of people possible here, but enough people to be able to take care of the patients we need to take care of. Um, this plan, of course, has been implemented in conjunction with the city, with the Department of Public Health, and with all hospitals and with our internal teams. Um, the way we do this is we meet twice every day with our incident command team to understand the situation and remove barriers for our care teams. Um, and then we meet twice weekly with hospitals in the city to better understand the citywide capacity and make sure uh, that, we are, uh, that we're all able to meet the demands. So where are we now? Um, uh, well, Grant men mentioned that um, the overall case caseloads in the city, um, they've been slowly rising. We're at about 1,019 uh, today. We've had 17 deaths. Um, our hospitalizations have uh, across the city have been basically flat. Um, there are 88 as of two days ago and slightly fewer than a week ago when there were 93. Today at ZSFG, we have 25 COVID positive patients, 12 of whom are in the ICU uh, and 10 of those who are on ventilators and 20 people with tests pending for a total of 45. Um, this puts us at a level orange in our surge plan, which has been fairly steady over the past three weeks. Um, what I'll say is uh, at ZSFG, we're serving about a third of the patients who are hospitalized in the city um, and there's a reason for that uh, because we are serve, serving and we always have served the most vulnerable in the city. And there are really two populations um, that we're concerned about uh, here um, who are among the most vulnerable. First is the Latinx population who have been uh, greatly disproportionately affected by, by this pandemic. About a quarter of those tested um, in the city are Latinx, tested and positive are Latinx. And that compares with about 15% representation in the population overall. 
Um, the other uh, very vulnerable population that we're concerned with is the homeless population. And uh, many of you probably read about the, uh, the, the uh, number of people who were positive in the MSC shelter south. Um, some of those we've seen hospitalized, very few, um, but we wouldn't uh, have fully expected to see all of those positive at that shelter need hospitalization so far. That might happen over the next week or two. Um, so overall, um, we're cautiously optimistic, as I think has been expressed by other speakers um, here this evening. Um, we remain prepared. Uh, we remain ready to take care of all of the community and here at ZSFG, especially uh, those who are the most vulnerable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ehrlich. Thank you all. I will now turn it over to Lisa Cisneros, Senior Director of Communications, who will serve as our moderator for the Q&A portion of our program. Lisa. Thanks, Francesca. So question uh, for um, Dr. Ehrlich. Um, about how many of the 1,000 patients have totally recovered? Speak to that for the thousand patients uh, or for the, the thousand people overall. Um, and that's likely because uh, most of them have not required hospitalization. Um, uh, we, we have seen a good recovery here, even among the people who have been um, in the ICU. I heard of a story today of a, a person who had been in our ICU, has been actually hospitalized for the past two to three weeks, has been in the ICU uh, more than once, um, and is ready to go home. So we've, we've definitely seen recovery, uh, even of the sickest patients we've seen here, uh, but I'm sorry I can't address uh, the thousand patients overall. Okay, thank so you. Perhaps I could just briefly, I think the experience we're seeing in San Francisco uh, is similar to the worldwide experience. Again, uh, over 80% of the patients recover on their own without needing significant medical care. It's that smaller subsection that need hospitalization. Again, the majority of those survive and go home. And it's really only the uh, vulnerable populations that uh, Dr. Colfax mentioned, particularly those with what we call comorbid disease, pre-existing heart disease or lung disease that uh, we really are concerned about. Okay, great. Um, here's a question for any of the physicians. As a senior citizen who is still working, can I expect additional protections in terms of returning to work after the general population? Grant, do you want to tackle that one? I'm sorry, I'm trying to, let me, I think that if, um, if you're a member of the a vulnerable population, those are the six, one of the questions is, is as we flatten the curve and ensure that uh, people take proper precautions. Um, I'm taking the question is after the most restrictive shelter in place um, is, is lifted, what sort of protections would be in place for people at higher risk, such as people over the age of 60? Um, I think it's, I can't uh, be specific, but I think it's likely um, as we move forward that taking general uh, precautions, um, uh, including wearing masks, uh, ensuring that uh, basic good infection control hygiene, such as washing your hands, ensuring um, that you don't go to work um, where people or engage in areas where people are, are sick, if you can avoid that. Um, those are likely to be some of the broader public health measures that we, that we need to take. And I think it's important to realize that it's going to be a while um, for all of us before um, uh, life returns to, to what we might think of as normal before the pandemic, and especially for people in these vulnerable populations, as it sounds like uh, this person may be, they're going to need to be um, uh, uh, specific interventions um, to help protect them um, after um, the, 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 the shelter-in-place orders um, are lifted, when they are lifted. It's, it's hard to speculate exactly when that would happen, but I would expect a period of time we're wearing, doing things like wearing masks, um, reinforcing those, those general public health infectious disease control measures, and then doing some degree of the physical distancing um, with, with people who are particularly high risk um, could be something that would be looked at uh, in, in, in the future. 
Okay, great. I guess also for you, Dr. Colfax, now that it has been four weeks since shelter in place orders were instituted, how do you think most newly diagnosed patients are contracting the disease? So I think that there, there are a number of ways. Um, unfortunately, um, some people are not able to fully um, shelter in place um, and that there is transmission uh, from known contacts, other people who have become infected. Um, and we've seen clusters of infections. So um, in places, um, in, in congregate settings that, that uh, Dr. Ehrlich mentioned, um, in, uh, in, in, in places where there are multiple multi-generational families living together, um, and in places um, where there's been apparently sustained contact despite the physical distancing. So I think that the key message here is that the shelter in place order, um, it was meant to slow the spread of the, of the virus. Um, very few people, if anybody, you know, in the public health field thought it would be that it would, that it would stop it. Right. So this is really a measure to slow the spread so we can prepare as we have and, 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 uh, for our healthcare system not to be overwhelmed, um, as we saw, unfortunately, in New York. Um, but we do expect to see um, more cases over time. We, expect, we especially uh, expect to see more cases as more people uh, get tested over time. Uh, the thing to really watch are these people, the number of people in the hospital with regard to the fact that they are the most seriously ill um, and to follow that trend over time. Okay. There's a question, how can folks volunteer for contact tracing efforts? So maybe I could take that. Um, our our uh, uh, Department of Epidemiology and our Global Health Science Department are taking this on in a very serious fashion. Uh, Dr. George Rutherford has put together a curriculum to uh, train people who otherwise were not trained public health officials. Uh, in the skills of, of uh, contact tracing. And uh, Dr. Colfax can comment more, but we anticipate we'll need more than 100 such individuals to manage just San Francisco, and then you amplify that across the state. It's a large workforce that has to be trained. Fortunately, the training is relatively straightforward. Uh, we have about 40 to 50 volunteers uh, from the UCSF community who are either trained up or are being trained right now to join Dr. Colfax's team uh, to get out there to do the contract tracing because it is the key issue. I think of it a little bit like a uh, post forest fire when the fire has gone through, but there's still brush that hasn't yet burned. What you have to do is identify the embers, the places where there can be a flare up and very quickly get out there in a public health workforce, do the contact tracing, do the testing and do the quarantining so that we acknowledge that likely for months, if not longer, we will have flare-ups in the community, but the key is to recognize them early, do the contact tracing and contain them, put out that ember before it becomes yet another raging forest fire. Uh, so uh, there are volunteer efforts through either the Department of Public Health or through UCSF, um, and we will need to uh, stand up a significant workforce. Um, this question is about testing. Will there be a time in the next three months or by fall when it will be feasible for everyone to get tested? So we have ramped up our testing capacity greatly. We have gone from being able to do uh, less than 100 tests a day uh, four weeks ago to now being able to do over 2,000 tests a day. As uh, Mark Larrett mentioned, we have a supply chain issue with the swabs, but we are working very hard on that. I think the larger question is, is it, does it make sense to test every single person? Uh, we do need to test a cohort of people that we can follow over time to understand how the virus is moving around in the community. But that is not testing everybody, because just if you have a negative test today, you're just as much at risk of becoming positive tomorrow. So, and, and clearly it's not feasible to test everybody every day. So we have a program that we are developing that we're working closely with uh, Dr. Colfax and his colleagues where we can start to do what is called sentinel testing, um, testing of groups in the community 
to understand uh, the, the incidence uh, of the virus in the community and also understand what we call the prevalence of COVID-19. That is how many people have had an infection that may not have been tested for, but we can now look for antibodies. But that is at the epidemiological population screening level to help our public policy officials make good decisions. It's not about testing every single person every single day. This one is also for you, Chancellor. What forms of COVID-related research are currently being conducted? You know, at, at a time of high anxiety and uh, some very dark uh, pictures that we're seeing from other cities and other countries around the world, the research response by our UCSF faculty and students has been truly heartwarming. We, we shut down what is the second largest biomedical research effort in the country, if not the world, uh, in order to do appropriate social distancing, with one exception, that is labs who pivoted to do COVID-19 uh, research. I would say that there are uh, three major areas of investigation that we're pursuing literally around the clock. One is better diagnostics, uh, more specific tests, both viral tests and antibody tests that have shorter turnaround time so we can get the results back quickly. One of the antibody tests that we're working on is uh, there are very special antibodies that we call neutralizing antibodies that are important to know about because what they do is, is give us an assurance that the person who has neutralizing antibodies is in fact immune. There are not commercial tests for those at the moment, so we have labs working aggressively to come up with those specific tests. We're also looking for drugs that could interfere with the viral replication, drugs that are already FDA approved for other purposes that could be repurposed uh, in, the, in the time frame of this particular seasonal cycle. And then the third, of course, is vaccines. That's what we need to truly get community immunity. It's not going to happen by enough people being naturally infected to get community immunity. That's ha that is half to come from vaccination, just as it does with seasonal flu. So they're the three areas. It's incredibly exciting to see the teams just devoted to this. And the other thing I would say that is exciting, uh, we are not filing any intellectual property on COVID-19 research. Uh, we don't want this to be about patents. We want this to be about cures. And the collaboration is enormous. I've been on the phone four times uh, in the last two days with colleagues at Stanford and Berkeley, standing up research teams, and we're reaching out to colleagues in uh, the Pasteur Institute in France, universities in New York, um, and that's happening everywhere around the world. So at a, at a dark time, uh, there is a very shiny, bright light that I'm excited that UCSF is playing its role. Great. And for Dr. Colfax, after already one month of shelter in place, I am concerned about patients with semi-urgent medical care needs. When should community physicians expect to be able to open their offices for semi-urgent patients, assuming offices abide by social distancing guidelines? Yes, and I, I appreciate the question, and I just want to thank um, everybody in the city for adhering uh, to, to the shelter-in-place order and doing the physical distancing, also known as social distancing. I think um, we are taking a hard look at the data. Um, there's, there's a real um, challenge here because we know uh, from the research that if we back away from the, the social distancing orders too quickly, that the virus can, can, can um, surge very, very quickly. So um, we're working with researchers at UCSF, modelers at UC Berkeley, talking to uh, health ex global health experts who are watching situations in places like South Korea and other places to figure out in an evidence-based way based on the facts and the science, what are the steps um, that we uh, would recommend to ensure that uh, people with, with semi-urgent um, health conditions um, chronic health conditions can get the care that they need while not putting um, unnecessary um, uh, risk uh, to them or to the public at large that would put us at risk for a coronavirus surge. So I think it's too early to be as specific 
as perhaps the questioner would like us to be, but we're certainly looking at it and uh, the, the, the decisions uh, will be iterative, but they will also be based on science data and facts uh, and on collective input, including from many people um, at UCSF and the health department. Okay, this is a two-part question for UCSF and Zuckerberg, San Francisco General. Are you seeing large numbers of staff getting sick? How many are tested versus uh, those who are able to stay at home versus those who are admitted into the hospital? Well, this is Mark Laird. I'll just answer. The, the answer is no, we're not seeing large numbers uh, getting sick. Uh, I think our total numbers uh, today uh, across that we've had reported to us uh, are in the in the 50 to 60 range across the entire campus. Uh, and most of those cases, we believe, are, are individuals who have uh, uh, picked up the virus uh, in the community. Uh, in some cases, there's a concern that uh, uh, Healthcare workers working side by side may even be transmitting it to each other, uh, even more than uh, getting it from from patients. So uh, it's something we're watching very very closely. Uh, we're collecting that data. The state wants that data. Uh, the city is uh, asking for that data, and I think it's uh, a very important uh, for us to uh, make sure that we're protecting our healthcare workers. They're obviously. Uh, when we talk about being ready for a surge, it isn't the hospital beds that are going to matter. It's whether we have the doctors and the nurses and the respiratory therapists there. That's what really, really matters most. Dr. Ehrlich? Yes, um, so here at Zuckerberg San Francisco General, we have a very similar uh, circumstance. Um, on a typical day, we have, we have 5,500 people who work here and we've had fewer than 10 people that we know of who have tested positive. Um, and just as Mark says, it's, it's really important for us to be sure that we're doing everything possible to protect our workforce. So for example, uh, not just making PPE available where it is appropriate for patient care, uh, but also now we have a, a policy just as UCSF and other hospitals do of universal isolation masking so that, um, so that each of us is um, not spreading disease to others. Uh, so we're, we're doing everything we can with PPE, um, also with contact tracing. So we have a very uh, active occupational health team here who uh, is testing our workforce as appropriate for symptomatic workers, who is doing contact tracing then um, once we have a positive case, and also advising our workers about being here or, or being at home um, and making sure that, that um, they are as healthy as possible. Here's a question, I think, uh, perhaps either for, for Dr. Uh, Colfax or Dr. Ehrlich. What is the breakdown of gender and ethnicity for COVID-19 cases and fatalities in San Francisco? So I can um, provide some general information there. So again, if you go to our uh, COVID-19 dashboard across the, uh, for, for the city, it summarizes uh, the data with regard to that question. Generally, um, what we are seeing is um, what we're seeing nationally in terms of the gender distribution. It's about 60% uh, uh, male, 40% uh, uh, female. Um, and, and that number is, those numbers are updated on a daily basis as test results uh, come in. In terms of the deaths, um, we haven't released that information. Thankfully, the numbers uh, of deaths have been relatively uh, small in San Francisco. Those will increase over time. Um, but because of uh, confidentiality issues, um, we need to um, have those numbers larger before we, we show those specific breakdowns. But I, I will say with gender, um, it's, it's consistent with the, with the national and international data that uh, unfortunately, oh, that, that males are more likely to, um, to die from the disease than, than, uh, than, than females. Can you speak to the ethnicity part? Oh, so the ethnicity numbers, um, again, those are up on our, on our, our, our dashboard. Um, as Dr. Ehrlich uh, mentioned, we are seeing, and as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, we are, we are seeing signs that, um, that uh, communities of color are being um, disproportionately affected. Um, 
uh, and and uh, again, uh, that's that's a deep concern to us. Um, and we're working with with stakeholders in those communities to ensure that they are supported and have the the materials they need um, to to uh, to to better prevent the disease where possible, and that they have access to healthcare. And again, those those numbers are updated every day at the um, COVID nineteen dashboard website. Another question for you, Dr. Colfax. Would you mind sharing more details on how we will preserve the privacy of patients as we partner with the contact tracing app? Sure, so privacy is incredibly important in these situations. And I just, you know, I think one of the key things in contact tracing um, that we, we need to earn uh, the trust and the endorsement of, of, of stakeholders who are using the app, that they see and feel the value for themselves, their family, and their communities. Um, we do have a team, again, that's working with UCSF, but a team that um, knows how to do this well. Um, they did it well before the pandemic for, for other infectious diseases like tuberculosis and HIV. Um, a lot of our contact tracing work is going to be based on our legacy of doing this well, well with HIV, and privacy is, is paramount. So uh, the information that will be collected will, will be uh, protected. We will only collect information um, based on, on public health need. Um, I want to emphasize that immigration status um, is not something that um, will determine how or where somebody would be cared for, and we're not collecting uh, highly sensitive, uh, some highly sensitive information like social security numbers or asking people about income. So um, it's vitally important that we earn the trust and, and that people um, see this as a resource, and it is a resource. Um, the, one of the main goals of this contact tracing is that people know, um, one, that they have potentially been exposed, that they have someone to reach out to and to talk to um, in a consistent way. Um, this is not just going to be a one-time text. This is going to be establishing a conversation and hopefully a relationship so we can make sure that those people and their families uh, get the information, the care, and the testing that they potentially need to ensure that they are they stay as healthy and protected as possible, as well as their as their community. I would also add that the app the app is going to be done in multiple languages and approaching this from a um, culturally humble and culturally competent way is is the foundation of of our work going forward. Thank you so much. Um, with that, I will turn it back to Vice Chancellor Vega for her closing remarks. Thank you, Lisa. I would like to thank all today's speakers, Chancellor Sam Hoggood, Dr. Grant Colfax, Mark Larratt, and Dr. Susan Ehrlich. And I would like to thank everyone that participated in this evening's discussion. It's important to realize that we are truly a global community. We are all in this together. And through continued collaboration, we will get through this public health challenge as we've done before. As you've heard tonight, this current crisis underscores the importance of academic research, public health expertise, and collective decisions and actions based on science. Thank you again for your time this evening. Be well.